All right, so today, uh, today we try, uh, we try our best to put it all in perspective to see why in the world do we care about about continuous functions. And uh, although we can't get the whole story today, I, I hope to shed some light and maybe sell it uh, a little better than than. Uh, than I've ever sold it, I think. Uh, I want to make sure that we see exactly, uh, you know, at least a little bit ahead and why this is important. So I'll go through four four big deals, uh, what I call big deal. This is a big deal, the fact that the limit goes through, the, the stuff about continuous functions, the EVT and the IVT, these are big deals uh, and, and they're directly related to continuous functions. So um, let's see Let's see if we can uh, sell it. Hopefully by the end of today you'll, you'll say, yeah, I love uh, continuous functions. Okay. Uh, last time we just learned what they are. Today we want to love them. Okay. So so here's the big deal. I call this big deal number one. Uh, the limit can go through continuous functions uh, under ideal conditions. Uh, this is uh, this can be done, and uh, it becomes extremely extremely helpful. Uh, consider the following idea here. Uh, could you? Would you? If you had the square root of some stuff here, a bunch of stuff here. And you had the limit. Could you just go through that and say, okay, I, you know what? I won't worry about the square root. I'll just say that they're equal, and I'll take the limit through the square root sign and put it in there. Uh, could you do that? Well, the, the truth is that in the beginning, when we were first learning limits, we we actually did do that. Um, we would take something like that, and we would just take the limit inside. So yeah, these have to be equal, and so we would go something like this. You work stuff inside, and you just do the square root, and you plug things in here, and you would say, well, that's uh, uh, 20 plus 3, and that's equal to the square root of 23. And that, that's because we were doing the famous plug-in method. We were doing plug-in method here, plug-in method here. You would ignore everything else and just put the x values wherever you saw uh, x, uh, where you would put the x value, whatever x is going towards, wherever you saw x in the expression. And, and that was a great way to to do stuff before before the epsilon delta definition when we were first learning limits. Um, that was what they call plug-in method. But uh, of course, uh, you know, after we, after you learn the epsilons and delta definition, then you, you know, your mind will, will never be the same. You, you won't look at limits the same way you can't. And that's because um, once the mind is expanded, it cannot be contracted. Now, if you would do that now, you should start your 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 conscience should should feel bad, should feel a little uneasy, kind of like when you take shortcuts in front of an old lady at the store. It should feel like that when you take this limit and say you should worry and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, am I doing something that's correct here? Uh, you know that that was okay before the epsilon deltas, but now could you prove it using epsilon deltas? Once the mind is expanded, it cannot be contracted, so you you begin to worry like a mathematician about perfection. There's three things in mathematics that we sell, perfection, beauty, and creativity. And we strive for those all the time. And so we want to make sure that the reasoning is good. Um, so after the epsilon def delta definition, you're not so quick to pull the trigger on this. And yeah, yeah, it's all right. You know, you shouldn't be so quick. You should be cautious. And uh, you should try to find, this would be a good exercise, proof, find an epsilon delta proof that says you could take that you could take this limit inside. In fact, I think I, I wrote one of these... Uh, uh, exercises on the homework, um, or I'm going to. My mind is just blending together what I've done and what I've planned to do. Uh, I can't tell the difference anymore what I did. But anyways, uh, this would be a really, really nice exercise um, to do. So, you know, you, you start to think, what would it take to really, really prove that? Well, you'd have to pull out your the big guns here. You'd have to pull out the uh, epsilon delta definition. See if we can move this out of the way. Let you see it. This is the big stuff right here. You'd have to pull out the epsilon. You know, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta such that blah blah blah. You know, you'd have to assume that this limit exists and it's finite. Maybe call it L, and then you have to prove that this guy is equal to L, and then you have to use the difference and set it less than epsilon and try to find a delta. Blah blah blah. This is a really nice problem. Um, when you're ready for it, I, I suggest you take a look at that. But but for now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to sell continuous functions, and 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 the precise answer to this problem and many many other problems like it is brought to you by this thing that I call the big deal number one. Big deal number one says that if your function is continuous, you can go through it. Here, here's how you do it: 
you see this function right here? This is the square root square root function, right? Uh, this would you could call this one f of x equals the square root of x. That's the function that you want to take the limit through, right? Your limit wants to go through this function, so this is the function that you got to look at. The theorem says, a famous theorem, uh, that's big deal number one, says that if this function is continuous at this limit, at this limit, if it's continuous at that limit, you're good to go. And that type of theorem we can prove epsilon deltas, and, and the implications are huge. Are huge. And this, the answer is given precise in terms of continuity. If the square root thing is continuous, the square root function is continuous at this point, it's okay to do that. Stamp it, certified for for sure. Okay. Um, here's a, here's an example. Suppose you wanted to take the limit. You want to know is this is this okay to take the limit through this square root? So I say so. Okay, you go ahead and do it, and you try to see what is this equal to. This is twenty three. Then what you have to ask is f of x, which is equal to the square root of x, is this function continues at 23? So you go back, this is the function f of x equals x squared. Uh, this is the point uh, 23, and then you have to analyze it there. Uh, you check the three things. Uh, does it, is it defined there? Yeah, it's defined square root of 23. Does the limit exist from both sides? Yeah, the limit exists from both sides. Check, and are they equal? Check, you check the three things, and boom, it continues at 23. And now you can be sure, without a doubt, that the limit is okay to go through there. You see that? that that's how you get the, the, that's the big deal. Continuity answers this question precisely. And, and uh, not just that question, the big deal is that it applies to so many other functions. Just imagine, uh, let's say, for example, uh, you wanted to do, let's take this example. Oh, look, LN. Haven't you ever been sitting around on a desk and trying to find a limit and you've wondered, hey, can I take this limit and can I put it through the ln function? Let's go, let's go in blue. Can I put the ln th the limit and bring it through the ln function so that I have the ln of the limit instead of the limit of the ln? Can I do that? Is it legal? And your expanded mind that knows about epsilons and deltas is cautious. It seeks perfection, beauty, and creativity and reasoning. And says, and, and your mind says, you know what? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. And you start to wonder, and that's great if you start to wonder. If you just do it carelessly, you're you're probably an engineer. Wah, wah, wah. He made fun of engineers. If you start to wonder whether that's correct or not, that's great for you. More part to you. I'm going to reward you with one of these. Um, you should be cautious. And I'm telling you, the answer to this, whether or not this is legal, is brought to you by what I'm calling this big deal number one. The limit goes through the function so long as the conditions are right. Here's here's the conditions. The limit that you're trying to go through is this function right here. So the, the function that we're talking about is ln x. And if you find this limit here, this limit, as x goes towards infinity, you could do a little rewrite. You can divide that by x, divide that by x, divide that by x, divide that by x. That looks like 1 over 7 to me. Stop me if I'm lying, but it looks like 1 over 7. So all I got to do is check my ln function at the point 1 over 7. And at the point 1 over 7, I'll go with red, 1 over 7. This is the point, and I got to check the three items. Is it defined? ln of 1 over 7. Is that a finite real number? Check. Does the limit exist at that point from the left, from the right? Are they equal? Check. And is the limit equal to the value of the function? Check. Okay, it continues there, so therefore it is okay to move the limit from the outside towards the inside. This is really, in essence, what you're doing here is you're doing the plug-in method, but you're doing it rigorously uh, on the foundation provided by the epsilon delta definitions, because now you're using limits which are founded on the epsilon deltas. So this is a much, much tighter, much more perfect um, way of, of doing the plug-in method or knowing when it works and when it doesn't. This tells you precisely, precisely when it works. If the function continues at the point where that limit is going towards, then it's okay to do that. But, and I'm telling you, the possibilities are endless. The square roots, the LNs, I mean, just imagine how many possible functions there are where uh, the function continues at a certain point. Think about this one. You have, you have e to some stuff here. e to some crazy stuff. Have you ever wondered, hey, can I take this limit and just put it up there? Wouldn't it be nice if I could just 
skip the E part and just put it way up there. Wouldn't that be nice? Say yes. That would be nice. Huh, I wonder when can I do that and when can I not? When is it legal? Because your mind is expanded now. It cannot be contracted. Now you know about epsilon deltas. Now you know about carefulness. You should be careful, cautious. But no worry, we've got the answer right here in what I call the big deal number one. The limit goes through the continuous functions if this function is continuous. See, this is the function that it's trying to go through, so I'll denote it here, f of x equals e to the x. And where is it going towards? As x goes towards infinity, that goes to zero. By the way, this is a super, super famous, ridiculously famous limit. Um, it was on previous homeworks, and uh, it's related, you know, we will see it again and again, and... Um, I hope you take some time to get to know this one. It's super famous. Anyways, it goes to zero, so therefore this limit would be equal to e to the zero, which would be equal to one. But but that's not so important. What I want to emphasize is the fact that you can go through it. Here's how you know if you can go through it. e to the x, and this limit is zero. This is important because now you have to look at the e to the x function and say, hey, around zero, around zero, am I continuous? And you check the three items. Uh, is the e to the zero finite and does it exist? Check. Does the limit exist and is finite? Check. Are they equal? Check. Okay, this e to the x is continuous at zero, therefore it's okay to put this limit through there. You may wonder, well, when would it not be okay? Well, I could give you an example really easily. Suppose you have the square root of uh, 3x plus 1 is equal to the square root of 3x plus 1 and x you wanted to take uh, the limit I'll keep it red take the limit as x goes to negative 1 and you want to know is it okay to take that limit as x goes to negative 1 well let's see if it's equal it's, let's see if it's good or not now you've powerful now you got the precise answer when this is okay and when it's not the, lim the function that it's going through is this square root function. This is the function that it, the limit is trying to go through. So you look, this is the question, this is the function you've got to analyze, square root of x. And where? At which point? This is continuous at, at whatever that limit is. Let me see, as x goes to negative 1, this would be negative 3 plus 1. That would be negative 2. So you look at that function. Um, that function looks like this, y is equal to the square root of 2, and then you, where are you going to look at it? You're going to look at, at negative 2. At negative 2, is the function defined? No. Does the limit exist? No, it's not even real. Hello? It's not even real, so in that case, uh, you, 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 you would be best advised not to play this, not to play this game where the, you're taking the function through the, fun, through the, uh, you're taking the limit through the function because that function is not continuous at that limit. You want me to say that again? It's easy, just rewind. <laughs> um, all right, so I hope uh, I sold you at least 25%, you're at least 25% sold on the idea that uh, continuous functions are good because they make limits so much nicer, uh, so much more firm, on firm ground. And now, let's go for the second big deal. If you guys need to take a break, just put it on pause. I'll be here. Alright, so a second big deal. This is a, a nice little thing here. Continuous pieces make continuous functions. Obviously, that's not the whole story, but this is a good way to remember it. Continuous pieces make continuous functions. What exactly do we mean by that? Well, suppose, hypothetically, suppose that, um, whoa, let's group these things, huh? Control G will group them. Let's make them small, get them out of the way. All right, so, so, so here, suppose that you knew that um, f of x and g of x were continuous at some point, I don't care where, let's say at point x equals c. If each piece, f and g, were continuous, you got two pieces. Suppose that you knew that when you multiply continuous piece functions, you get continuous functions. Well, then the product would be continuous. Suppose you knew that the sum of continuous functions gives you continuous functions. 
then this, this would be continuous. Suppose you knew that a constant times a continuous function gives you a continuous function. Well, then this would be continuous. All these little pieces, all these pieces are made from continuous pieces. Therefore, every one of them is continuous. You can have a continuous party here. You can make all sorts of combinations from two continuous pieces. This is just a little tiny piece of it. Uh, I mean, the possibilities are endless. And that's the second big, big deal. Uh, that uh, you can very, very, very quickly uh, amass a huge, huge family of continuous functions just from two pieces, for example. I, I should caution you, when you have the quotient, you don't want the bottom to be, the limit of the bottom to be zero at that point C. If, if the bottom is zero, then all bets are off, but all these other ones are okay, even if they're zero or not. As long as they're finite and exist, they're okay. Even, this one's okay if it's finite and exists, but the bottom cannot be zero, okay? Uh, and, and let me show you this in action. I'll show you some action. Talk is cheap. Okay. Uh, in, in the previous homework, you had an exercise to prove that um, the function is con if the function is a constant, like 5 or 7, then it's continuous. So you have to go through the three items. Uh, show that the value is finite the limit, show that the limit is finite in... in it, sorry, let me start over. Show that the value of the function exists and is finite. Show that the limit exists and is finite. And show that they're equal. And you had to do that for homework. So you should be able to know, show that any constant function is continuous. Check. And there was also a similar one to show that x is continuous. Or might, I might even have a generic one like mx plus b. Show that that one is continuous. Which would be a variation of this one. B that is a may. It should be easy to prove that this function is continuous and that one's continuous for all possible x values, for all real numbers. Now the fun starts. If you know that x is continuous and every constant is continuous, what sort of mix and matching can you do to make more continuous functions? This is the second big deal. You could do something like this. Uh, you could say, you know what, I, th I would say that, uh, I'll call this h of x. h of x is 3 times x. Well, you know what? That's a constant, one of these, times one of those. Well, if the product of two continuous functions is continuous, well, then this one's continuous. Check. And you don't have to th use the three items. You use the properties. By the way, those properties I'll have listed on the homework. Um, but basically, they're, they're just these uh, adding, multiplying, dividing, as long as you don't divide by zero. Uh, what else could you do? Let me see. Could you take another function? I'll call it uh, h... Let's call it a different h. h2 of x, which is equal to 3x plus 5. Is that continuous? Well, yes, it is, because look, it was made from a continuous function plus another one of these. This one was already continuous, and this one, these are all continuous, so I add them together. A constant plus a 3x, I get something continuous. See that? What about uh, another function? I'll call it h3 of x. What about just x times x? Is that continuous? Well, yeah, because it's made up of two of these pieces multiplied together. So that's got to be continuous. By the way, this is x squared. And you could go on all, all, all day. If h4 of x, we could call uh, 3x squared plus 5x plus 7. Is that continuous? Yes, it is. Everything here is made up of pieces of these. It's uh, a constant times that one times that one. That's the first piece. Plus a constant times that one plus another one, another constant. If you look at it that way, decompose it, this is the sum of products of continuous functions and therefore continuous everywhere. This is huge because you know what you're doing here? In a matter of two minutes, you're reasoning through the ideas of why every single polynomial, or every single real polynomial, is continuous everywhere. This is the reasoning behind it. That's that you proved a lot of things already. Imagine every single polynomial in the world, and you can prove it just systematically by this type of reasoning. Um, for example, we, we you know if, by just sm taking small little tweaks, we this will have shown that all degree two polynomials are continuous. If I just ch chosen a generic uh, number instead of the three, like a like a k or like an a, uh, generic constants here would would give you the the generic statement that all degree two polynomials are continuous, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how you build you build continuous functions from continuous little pieces. And you get something huge, a huge statement, like all polynomials are continuous everywhere. See, I told you that's big deal number two. You see why they pay me? They don't tell you that in books. It took me a thousand years to articulate it this way, to see it clearly. 
Uh, here's here's another another instant, another little example of that. Watch this. This is beautiful. Suppose that you knew that sine x is continuous everywhere, which it is. In fact, I, I also wrote an exercise. This is a very, very interesting exercise. Show that sine x is continuous everywhere. It's interesting because you have to show that the limit exists everywhere, and you have to use epsilons and deltas or properties or something rigorous. That's fun to do. And then you have to show that the values everywhere existing is finite, and you have to show that they're equal. And that that's kind of interesting to do. It was a homework. Anyways, I'll let that slide for now. Suppose you show that sine x is continuous, and you show that you've shown that every constant function is continuous. What, what do you think about this then? H of x, which is equal to sine squared x, is that continuous? Think, 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 think. Yes, it's got to be continuous because it's two of these ones multiplied together. Check. Uh, what about this one? I'll call this h2 of x. Another one, negative sine squared x. Would that be continuous? Yes, because it's negative 1, a constant, times another one that's continuous. So that would be continuous. Check. What about another one? h3 of x, which is equal to just 1. Would that be continuous? Yes, because it's one of these. It's a constant. That would be continuous. And what if I added these two together? What if I added... I'll call this h, I'll call it h4 of x, and I'm going to add these two. So I got 1 minus uh, sine square of x. Is that continuous? Yes, no, why? Well, this is the big deal. Continuous pieces make continuous functions. So this one's continuous everywhere, that one's continuous everywhere. So if I add them together, of course I get something continuous better. Or con some, of course I get something continuous everywhere. But wait, there's more. Isn't this something famous? 1 minus a sine square of x? Haven't you seen that before somewhere? You can always exchange that. We have a perfect identity. That says you can always, always exchange that for a 1 minus... Uh, or no, 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 no. You can always exchange that for a cosine of uh, x squared. And so you've just proven that cosine square x is continuous everywhere. Okay? Just like that. Then if you tweak it just a little bit more, you, you could probably prove by using some identities that cosine of x is continuous everywhere. And so by mixing and matching, you can prove a lot of other things uh, by continuity. And that's why I think this belongs in the uh, list of big deals for continuous functions. Little continuous pieces added or multiplied together uh, give you a uh, another continuous function. Okay, so hopefully I've sold you on continuous functions at least 50%. Okay, I got four big deals, two down, two more to go. They get better. Here's another uh, big deal, I call this big deal number three. It's called the Intermediate Value Theorem, or IVT for short. Okay, and it, the story goes something like this. Uh, let me see if I can uh, make it. So, so suppose that you've got a, uh, a uh, blah here, a region, and suppose we label it, uh, that maybe this is the US and this is Canada, and maybe you're here driving, um, and there's just a boundary here that you can't go past, and then suppose you have the following, suppose that at 1 o'clock or something like that, um, say at 1 o'clock, 1 p.m., you're here in the USA, and suppose somehow after one, after being here at 1 p.m., at 5 p.m., you end up over here in Canada. And what has to happen if that, in order for that to be true? The IVT idea would say that that uh, one or one or two, one of two things had to have happened. One of two things had to have happened. Either you moved along, it was one, two, whatever, and at some point or another, you had to cross the border, right there. And move over to Canada. At some point, you had to cross. That's one possibility. Or the other possibility is that you've got some magical power that made you be discontinuous, discontinuous from position. Boom, you popped out of here, and boom, you popped out of there. Those are the only possibilities, according to the IVT. The IVT would say either you are discontinuous. 
you have the Harry Potter spell to appear and reappear. Or you had to cross the border at some point between 1 and 5. At some time between 1 and 5, you had to have crossed the border. Either that or you have some power to be discontinuous and appear here or disappear here. So those are only two possibilities. That's that's what the IVT uh, theorem says, and it, and it says that you know you, the border could be here or here. It wouldn't matter uh, as long as it's between this position and that position. Um, you had to have crossed from 1 p.m. to uh, 5 p.m. You had to have crossed the border here if it was here or here or here or here or here, anywhere between that value and that value. If you were here at 1 and here at 5, you had to have uh, crossed it at some point um, to get there. Either that or, or you're discontinuous. That's the only other possibility. That uh, you can uh, disappear here and appear over here. Some sort of discontinuity. Okay? That's the IBT. Of course, the challenge is to put that in, in actual uh, mathematical terms and to make it really understandable. Um, but uh, that, that's what I'm. That's what I like doing. Um, so that's why they pay me. Let me do it. Uh, so so here it goes. You you choose some value here a. And you choose some value here b. And you say okay, this one is f of a, and this one is f of b. And and then this value over here could be anything. Any any w here. Um, that you want. And so uh, this let's call this W the height. So the theorem would say that uh, for any w, value W where W is between, we need to have W between what values? Between F of A and F of B. For any W that's in there, there exists. That's the there exists symbol. There exists a, a number over here. Some value here C, where you must have crossed. There exists a C uh, between such that C is between uh, A and B. It's got to be between A and B. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see if you can see that. See it? The C's got to be between A and B such that f of C he uh, f of C is exactly equal to W. Okay, that's what the intermediate value theorem says. It says here you can actually do it. Here's what it would look like written in a professional way. If f x is continuous on some closed interval and W is any value between the the A and the B. That's between here. Any W. Uh, w could be here. Wait. W could be here, 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 here. It wouldn't matter. You have to cross it. As long as it goes from here to here, from that point right there, all the way to that point, from B, F of B to F of A. It could be anywhere. You see, you have to have crossed it at least once. It doesn't tell you how many times you cross it. It could go up and down. It doesn't even tell you how to find the spot where you cross it. It just tells you that you have to have crossed it or you're discontinuous, of course. For any W that's between F of A and F of B, then uh, there exists uh, F of C between them such that F of C is equal to W. That's the fancy way of saying the IBT. Okay, often the IBT is used to prove, for example, that some functions have roots somewhere. For example, look at this polynomial. Degree 3 is not that easy to solve. You don't have quadratic formula. But you can say something about the roots. Suppose you were to set that equal to 0. Here's the Here you are setting it equal to 0. If you set it equal to zero, what you've got is you've got a, a third degree equation. Um, not exactly a routine problem, Depend, demands a little attention, but and it's telling you that prove that one of the solutions is between zero and one. So here's what you do, you, you look at zero, if what's f of zero, f of zero would be one. So at zero, you might one here, zero, one. And then you look at f of one, at f of one you are at one, 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 I think that's negative 2, so at 1 you're at negative 2, negative 2. 
right? So, so what does that tell you? No matter what the function did here, it starts here and it ends here. So it couldn't stay up here and just stay there. It has to get here somewhere. And it's not discontinuous. Since it's continuous, it's got to cross here. And at one point or another, between 0 and 1, you have to have crossed this line. That's, that's what the IVT says. No matter how you draw it, if you start here and end up here, continues without lifting your pencil, you have to have crossed exactly this line. And at, at that point, when it crosses, then the equation will have a solution to uh, uh, f of x equals 0. Okay? Here's another look at it. Oh, oh yeah, so I took, I actually I took a much, much more challenging problem. This is not even a, a polynomial. This is a trig functions mixed with uh, log functions and some uh, degree one coefficients. It is crazy, crazy, crazy. But you look at f of 0.5 and it's approximately equal to 2.5. And you look at uh, f of 2 and it's approximately negative 4. As I've drawn here, and so so, what does that tell you? It tells you that somewhere between 0.5 and 2, you gotta have a root. It doesn't tell you how to find it, but since it's continuous, um, by the way, it might take a little bit of thinking to see why that's continuous, but it is. And the IVT says, hey, I could choose any number you want up here. I could, if as long as it's below the 2.5 there's a solution to it between 0.5 and 0.2. This one, there's a solution between these two. There's a solution to that one. I can move this anywhere on this range, up or down, for any number between negative 4 and, and 2. And since the function continues, there's, I will always, always be able to find a, a point C down here that, that gives me that root or that value. Okay? That's what the uh, IVT says. Okay, that's uh, kind of a medium deal. I don't know if I would say like it's, like it's not like a big, big, big deal, but it's kind of like a 75% big deal. Okay, let's go on to the fourth, uh, fourth big deal. So this one was uh, proven in the late 1800s by uh, Bolzano, the um, Catholic priest. Uh, Bolzano's proved the extreme value theorem, and this one is a big, big deal. Um, so, so it, it 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 talks about extreme values, and uh, consider this function: two x plus one, or the range uh, from two to five. So the little round thing means it's not included in that endpoint. The function looks something like this. Uh, it looks something like this, more or less. And, and then you ask a simple question like, what's the minimum? Here's a simple, simple but profound question. What's the minimum value attained attained by your function, by y, over this range? Well, it's going down, 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 down. So the minimum value would have to be this one. That's the minimum. Minimum is easy. Uh, Minimum is easy, right there. I could plug it in there. Two times two is uh, four plus one is five. Check. That wasn't too bad, right? But things start to get a little interesting when you ask for, in this case, the maximum value. What's the maximum? You may be tempted to say, well, it would be five. I plug in five, and I go to five times two is ten. Eleven is the max, and that seems attractive for about two seconds but then you realize wait a minute five was not even in the domain so there's an empty hole here so that's not good you can't say attain 11 because then you can't get to five you got to get closer and closer to five but not equal to five so so 11 is not the uh, max they say well maybe it's 10.9 well not really because it does get past 10.9 you know, like 10.99. And you say, okay, 10.99. No, it gets past that. In fact, you sit there and try to think, what is the maximum value that this function attains? And, and you'll have to be thinking for a long, long, long time until you run out of options and you have to come to the grip, come to grips with the idea that maybe 
Maybe some functions don't have a maximum value over some interval like this. In fact, they don't. This one has no, no maximum value. Uh, any point that you find in here, I can find a bigger one. Any point that you find how big it be, if it's in this range, I can find you a bigger one. So there'll never be a max. And you can't say phi because that, that's not in the domain. We're excluding phi from the interval, so it's a very, very nice paradox. Something for you to think about. Um, oh man, and what does it have to do with continuous functions? Well, here, some functions do not have a maximum value. Hope you got that. Uh, and you say, well, maybe it's because the interval was open and I'll make it closed. Well, even if you make it closed, check out this function. This one looks like this. It looks like an asymptote here, an asymptote here. It really looks like 1 over x minus 4, which really looks like 1 over x shifted to the right 4. The 3 just changes the shape a little bit. And here are my values from 2 to 5. And I ask you, what's the maximum value? You say, well, maybe the maximum value is 10. Well, no, there are bigger ones than that. Maybe it's 100. Well, no, there's bigger ones than that. And so you can keep going forever and ever and ever. There's always a bigger one than that because this goes all the way to infinity. So you soon realize that this one has no max. And it neither does have a max when you go down. Any y value that you choose, there's always a lower one and a lower one and a lower one. So it has no min and no max. See? So, so some functions do not have a maximum value or a minimum value. And... And what the IV, what the uh, extreme value theorem says, the theorem that Volzano proved at the end of the 1800s, says, hey, I got it. I got the key, the right ingredients, I got the right language to tell you precisely, precisely when a function has an extreme value, or extreme values max and min. I could tell you without a doubt, you only give me two ingredients. If you give me two ingredients, I don't care how crazy you want to draw the function, you cannot beat me at this game. If you give me a continuous function, over a closed interval, game over. I will always, always, always be able to show you that the function attains a maximum and a minimum value in that range. So he articulated with precision exactly, exactly when you have a max and a min. Uh, he said, uh, all I need is two ingredients. Give me continuity and a closed interval, game over. I will prove to you that and you cannot draw a function crazy enough to beat me at this game. You, you, it'll always, always have to have you always have to attain a max and a min. And that's kind of interesting, and you might wonder, well, why? Why is that a big deal? Uh, it seems like kind of uh, almost common sense. So you've got a function here. Of course, it's got to reach a max and a min if, if the interval is closed. You think, well, that's not really a, a big deal. And, and at first sight, you could be right. It doesn't seem like a big deal to the ordinary uh, undertaker out there. But wait, there's more. Um, so, a long, long, long time ago, humans had something big. Something big was brewing up inside our cognitive uh, developmental uh, placenta. A uh, huge, huge idea. I told you, in this whole class, we only have one or two beautiful, life-changing, world-changing ideas. One of those ideas is the fundamental theorem of calculus. And that was brewing a long, long, long time ago. To deliver this idea, to deliver this idea requires uh, an unsung hero, sort of a regular, regular person called a, a midwife. And the midwife to deliver the fundamental theorem of calculus is, of course, the mean value theorem. That right there, that is, you know, the the, the mean value theorem is the midwife for calculus because by itself it's ordinary, it's really forgettable, it's not really a, a star player, but it helps deliver. Uh, astonishing and elegant and big, big, big results. You say, well, so what? What does that have to do with our chapter? Well, guess what? The mean value theorem was brewing up and it needs to be delivered by a midwife as well. Who's going to deliver the mean value theorem? Of course, something big, something called Rolle's theorem. But Rolle's theorem also needs to be delivered. Who's going to deliver Rolle's theorem? You guessed it, the extreme value theorem. The one we're just doing right now, but with continuity. That's roughly the sequence of events that makes this a huge, huge topic. The extreme value theorem, the one that says that if you have 
a closed continuous function, you, you attain a maximum minimum, that's the EVT. That will give you Rolle's theorem, okay? And once you've got Rolle's theorem, Rolle will give you MVT. And once you got MVT, MVT will give you the fundamental theorem of calculus, the jewel of the 17th century, perhaps the jewel of the last two or three centuries, uh, as far as thinking goes. Nice, huh? It's a nice story. I told you, I used to be an art major. Uh-huh, not just a pair of pretty hands. Uh-huh. All right, I think uh, this is getting past uh, what should be done in one day. I think we should cut it out. What do you guys think? All right, so soon I'll have homework for this. Check it out.